This is David Larson, opinion editor for the Carolina Journal. Today on Issues and Insiders, we have with us Daniel DiMartino. Daniel is a fellow at the Manhattan Institute. He's a PhD candidate at Columbia University studying economics, and he's the founder of the Dissident Project, which brings him here with us today here in North Carolina. Thank you, Daniel, for being with us. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So Daniel, um, as I mentioned, you're the founder of the Dissident Project. Um, would you mind just saying a little bit about what that is and how it came to be? Yeah, the Dissident Project is this organization that sends immigrants who lived in socialist and other authoritarian nations to high schools to tell our stories um, with the goal of really instilling gratitude in the kids for living in America, which is a, a truly free and prosperous nation, and also instilling in them support for the reasons that we are a free and prosperous nation, which is our constitution, it is our, our free enterprise system. And so um, I say our stories because I'm originally from Venezuela. And, and so we have speakers from Venezuela, from Cuba, from Iran, North Korea, China, Zimbabwe, Eritrea, and, and we're recruiting and, and we do this at no cost at all to the high school um, with, with, with the goal of reaching as many kids as possible. So these are countries that have been totalitarian, many of them socialist. Um, what do you think that the, uh, what's been the response from, from students who come from America? Are they aware that there's it's so different in these other nations? Well, most of the students don't know anything about the countries we come from. And, and reasonably, you know, there, there's a lot of different uh, countries that are under tyrannical regimes and, and things that I've learned from our own other speakers, right? Uh, you know, we have uh, one of our speakers, his name is Angus Omteklu. He escaped Eritrea. Eritrea is a country in the Horn of Africa next to Ethiopia and Sudan, which is also dubbed the North Korea of Africa. It's illegal to leave Eritrea. They will shoot at you if you try to cross the border. Uh, and he lived for many years in a refugee camp in Ethiopia. He managed to come to the United States and now he's doing a PhD in Boston. He got his asylum here. And, and, and he said, I, one of the quotes that really has stuck with me for forever is, I didn't know what choice was until I came to America. Mm. Because they could never choose what to eat in the supermarket, what to drink in, in a store, you know. And they couldn't choose anything in their lives. They couldn't choose where to work or, or you know, their, their times, nothing. And, and that's what living in totalitarianism is like. And that's important for American students to learn, and they do. And, and when they come out of these talks, they're always so impacted because they see somebody who's close to their age, because we recruit mostly very young uh, people who live in those countries, and countries that are currently under those regimes. So that they don't think that totalitarianism and socialism are things of the past or the Cold War. They are not. There are countries today that are living like that. So do you have any a story maybe of somebody that you saw the light turn on where you know, they had not been aware of this and then a particular story touched them where they, were, they saw that, you know, this is not so bad in America. Maybe, you know, socialism, which is portrayed by a lot of the popular culture as a good alternative, maybe a silver bullet for a lot of our problems. Maybe that's not really something that we should move towards. Yeah, well, we get a lot of questions, at least I do in my talks, because I talk about how Venezuela went from being a free and prosperous country to being now a poor um, and socialist country. And that's an important example because most of these other countries have always been tyrannical, have always been poor. Venezuela was not always poor and was not always a dictatorship either. And, and so that's why our example is so important because socialism entered Venezuela democratically. It was not mm -hmm. through a violent revolution or war or invasion. Um, so it's important for Americans to know that example because it's the example that is the most applicable to us. Bernie Sanders always talks about democratic socialism, you know, so... I we guess. had democratic socialism, mm -hmm. and so democratic socialism he supported, which on his website he said that Venezuela was a much more equal and prosperous place in the United States, where you could get better education. You know, this is a man who went to the Soviet Union for his honeymoon. You know, of course I think that there are people who want to turn us into Venezuela because they've told us so for many years. Uh, and so they're not willing to keep saying that because now things have gone really bad. But we're getting to the story of... Um, you know, kids that have been impacted, they ask me things like, well, but what about what the Nordic countries do? Mm. And my answer to that is always, those countries are doing really well because they implement good policies, but the policies that were being proposed in the United States are not the policies of the Nordic countries. Yeah. The Nordic countries have school choice, 
They have lower corporate taxes than the average state in the United States. They uh, balance their budgets. I've never heard a socialist say that we need school choice, we need to balance the budget, and we need to lower taxes on corporations. They even privatized <laughs> the post office. That's right. Um, so for those who aren't very aware of, you know, you mentioned Venezuela, it's where you're from, and that it's, it's a place a lot of people are fleeing. For those who aren't really aware of that story, could you give kind of a, a broad overview of, and uh, maybe we can get into your personal history after that, but first, kind of just a broad overview of, of what was Venezuela like before socialism, and then what has the impact on the country been? Yeah, well, right after World War II, Venezuela was really benefiting from the fact that uh, there was a growing global economy after the, the war, which demanded a lot of oil. And Venezuela is the country with the largest oil reserves on the planet. And so almost, you know, in fact, Venezuela was, uh, after the United States, the largest oil producer on the planet. The Saudis were not producing oil yet. And so as the economy grew, Venezuela was really in an economic boom, such that by 1950, Venezuela was the fourth richest country on the planet, mm. just behind um, Canada, the United States, and Australia. So because what? You know, Europe was destroyed by the war. Asia and Africa were too. The rest of South America was very poor. They didn't have natural resources. They were not democratic. Uh, Venezuela was. And so th that's, that's why Venezuela was really, really free. And ta the, we had very little taxation, very little regulation. Um, I was reading a book recently, which is um, about basically how it was Venezuela's economy in the 50s. And it, it was obvious to the, these American economies how Venezuela was a much more freer, a, a much freer economy than the United States, even then. But that, that changed over time, right? By Venezuela stayed a pretty f relatively free country until the 70s. And that's when the, the, country, the, the country's government, which was democratically elected, began to see the oil industry as nothing more than a way to finance a lot of welfare spending and redistribution mm. and buying boats. So they took over the oil industry in, 19, in the 1970s. Uh, and that's what started giving the government a lot of power, also made us very much dependent for our tax revenue in oil. So every time there was a fluctuation in the oil price that affected the government very heavily, and the ability to help the poor. Um, and so that created a lot of instability that led until to, to, in, to the 1990s when there, there was a big economic crisis with oil to people really being disappointed in the political class. And because they, they were co obviously corrupt politicians like in every developing country. And the consequence was that they elected somebody who was an actual socialist, who was Hugo Chavez. And when he was elected in 1998, promising to help the poor by taking away the property of the rich, by uh, giving free housing, free food, free healthcare, education, and all these things that are countries you have because we're a rich country, because we are a country with oil. And he told us, you know, we would never become like Cuba. We're not an island. We are uh, a democracy. We, um, we have oil. Obviously, we can never become like Cuba. Yet today, Venezuela is just as unfree as Cuba. Venezuela, it's true, we're not an island. And because we're not an island, 7.1 million people have escaped. And that is the largest refugee crisis in the world. And that's what the socialist policies of Hugo Chavez led us to. And we can talk about those policies if you want. So in your life being, uh, you're in your 20s, you must have seen that transition from being fourth wealthiest nation in the world to, to now the largest refugee crisis in the world. That's right. As, at a personal level, how, you know, grow, as a child just seeing that transition, um, how, how did that impact you and your family? Well, uh, well, when I was, I, I had a very happy childhood because I had a very good family that, you know, we loved each other. We all lived very close to each other in the city of Caracas, the capital. And, but you know, that, that started changing, right? My, my two older, oldest cousins, they left the country first. Um, and, you know, my, my family started not being able to buy certain items, you know. There was first, when I was uh, maybe um, in elementary school, a couple of weeks we didn't have milk. Mm. And that's how it began. And no milk a couple of weeks, then we couldn't find our favorite things to buy in the grocery store. Then, you know, it took longer to get things in the grocery store. Then rationing began, right? And then we had to use our ID to actually buy anything. And then it was the government assigned us by the time I was a teenager, a day of the week to go to the grocery store. Mm. Uh, and I could only go Mondays and Saturdays. 
my dad too because we are, are both national ID numbers and they're in the same number. So we were assigned the same day, uh, which is worse actually because uh, see, when you're assigned the same day, that means that you're less likely to get the new truck with new de deliveries. Um, you had to game the system. You had to bribe people to buy things. Um, and that, that's just on the food part, right? There was also hyperinflation. I couldn't fit enough cash in my wallet to buy anything anywhere. Um, there, you know, the electricity wasn't working. We started getting blackouts every week. Sometimes I, th there was a time when there was a whole month in which my building did not get running water. Hmm. No running water. Imagine going from living a middle class lifestyle to having no running water, no electricity, no food in your community. That's what they did to us. And that all happened because Chavez nationalized the grocery stores, he nationalized the banks, he nationalized the farms, he nationalized, when I mean national I mean the government takes over your property. And no matter what people did, they would take it from them and there would be no you know, due process for this, there would be no compensation. And even if there had been compensation, it doesn't matter. When the government owns the property, there's no incentive for them to work. And the few businesses that were left private, especially all the retailers and the small ones, um, the government came in and said, you can only charge this much for your services and what you sell because the greedy businessmen are the cause of inflation. It's not our policies, it's not our overspending and our deficits. It's not printing money, it's you, the greed of, of, of the capitalists. So when they put price controls, nobody's going to sell at, at a loss. And rather than selling at a loss, they just don't sell, so that's how we got the shortages, and that's mm. why we had the rationing. And so you and your family and a lot of other people who are used to a wealthier, even middle class, or you know, just having the basic necessities, very quickly moved from, from those comforts to not having any of that. Um, and it seems you, know, you yourself have come to the United States. A lot of other people in Venezuela, you're saying um, it's the largest refugee crisis in the world that that's been the impact of that move to socialism and the lack of basic necessities. Can you say a little bit about that, about how your family decided to come here and, and why this refugee crisis, the, the biggest in the world, bigger than even Ukraine, um, is, is happening at the moment? Yeah, I think it's very important for Americans and really people all over the world to understand that the greatest refugee crisis in the world is not because of a war. It's because of uh, terrible government policies. Um, and, and a lot of people make the excuse that, oh, you know, what happened in Venezuela is simply because they were an oil-dependent country, they were a corrupt government, and it's hard to excuse the socialism part. But the truth is that there are many corrupt countries and there are many oil-producing countries in the world that have nothing to do with the situation of Venezuela. I never saw people escaping Saudi Arabia by foot through the desert, millions of them, to neighboring countries, when oil prices go down. I don't even see them starving on the street, even though it's a desert where you can't plant anything. In Venezuela, you, we say that you can throw a seed in the street and that tree will grow because we're a tropical country. And yet people starve in Venezuela, they don't starve in Saudi Arabia. And do you think Saudi Arabia is not corrupt? Are they not dependent on oil? Much more than Venezuela. Yet they don't, th that doesn't happen there. They violate women's rights and they violate you know, religious freedom in ways that Venezuela doesn't. But the difference is that Saudi Arabia respects pro property. They allow people to start businesses. They allow them to freely trade with each other. Venezuela does not, which is why the cause of Venezuela's crisis and the refugee crisis is not corruption. It's not even the lack of democracy. It is socialism. And, um, and as a result, 7.1 million people have fled, most of whom live in the rest of Latin America. In Colombia, there's over 2 million Venezuelans. In Peru, there's over 2 million. And then the rest are distributed in like Chile, Ecuador, and the United States, and, and a few other countries. And in the US, it's super interesting, the dynamics, because the Venezuelan population has grown from almost zero in the year 2000 to 750,000 in 2021. And today, we're probably more. Um, and this is according to the census. So, so it's been a huge growth. It's the fastest growing immigrant group in the United States. It's also the most highly educated Hispanic group in the United States because more than 50% of Venezuelans here have a college degree compared to 30% of Americans and compared to even fewer of the Hispanic groups. Um, and very few, if none at all, of the Venezuelans are high school dropouts. So, so these are really usually very highly educated people who come here. Um, more than one in five have a graduate degree. 
I mean, it, we're talking about a, a very different population, um, but a population that because we are recent immigrants, most of them don't have uh, um, much English proficiency. And so there's a lot of barriers to, uh, because of the lack of English proficiency, because of licensing and things like that, to exercising their, their professions here. Uh, interesting dynamic um, from that. So many people coming from Venezuela um, in the recent elections, we saw uh, the ones who were you know, naturalized citizens and could vote, a pretty solid majority had voted for, for conservative candidates in, after the election polls. Um, and it seemed like a similar dynamic you see with people from Cuba or Vietnam or some other countries. So um, yeah, it seems like you know, for people who grew up in that circumstance, they're trying, they're seeing some hints in the American political system of similar movement, and they, they want to uh, maybe vote against that. Is that something you see in a lot of, um, well, I guess you're the speakers you have, that's, that's part of what they're here is to warn Americans, don't repeat uh, the problems that we had in our countries. Yeah, I mean, that, that's the goal of the dissident project, right? The goal of the dissident project is to make sure that the students are aware of what happens in the rest of the world so that they get perspective and are grateful for what we have. And, and that's an important thing to give students um, an, an idea about because if, if they are not grateful for what they have, they're more likely to support really radical changes that are going to tear apart the country. And so starting from a point of understanding how well we are, how well off we are, will help us improve where we actually need to improve and, and copy the countries that we actually have to copy and not the countries that we do not have to copy. Um, and so, so that's the goal of this project. And, and you mentioned the dynamic of, of voting and, and of these immigrants from socialist countries. You know, it's, it's true not just in the United States, it's true in other countries. Uh, it's true in Chile, where the Venezuelans were overwhelmingly opposed to the socialist constitutional changes in Chile that was defeated. It's true in Spain, where they're very much opposed to the Communist Party. Uh, it's true in Colombia, where, where they were very much opposed to the, to the new left-wing government, who are friends with Maduro, of course. So for Venezuelans, if you are a politician and you are ever supported the Venezuelan regime or Cuba, you are out. Mm. You are 100% out, and with very good reason. Do you see any warning signs, um, just as somebody coming from Venezuela, very attuned to th those kind of dangers, just looking at the political landscape here in America, warning signs that, you, that worry you in, in a new country that you don't want to see head in that same direction? You know, the, the biggest warning signs I see is the, the motivations of people that they have to, to reach their goals, right? I, I feel like for many politicians and for many policymakers, their goal is not actually to make America better off, but to hurt the other side. Mm. They want to win. They don't want to make America better. And, and that's, that's a slippery slope to you know, the, the envious cycle that led in Venezuela to we're going to take away things from the rich because the, the poor are poor because the rich are rich. And in the United States, they don't just use class to divide people. They use race. They use gender. They use everything else. Uh, and that's a Marxist tactic, right? It's what we talk about when we mentioned the word cultural Marxism. Cultural Marxism is simply Marxism, which is class warfare, but applied to other uh, divisions in society, which is race warfare, gender warfare, and that's cultural Marxism. It's divide and conquer. And uh, that's what concerns me. And it's, not, it's something that concerns me both from the left and from the right. And, and that's something that we really need to be mindful of and not support people who, who try to divide us in, in that way. Okay. Um, before I let you go, anything else you want to uh, tell people about your, your, the dissident project or your work? Yeah. Well, if you want to bring us to your high school, to, if you're a teacher, you're a parent, you're a principal, uh, or you know, you know somebody who is, you can reach us in dissidentproject.org, and you can book one of our speakers of your choice at no cost to speak at your high school. It could be online, it can be in person, whatever you can do. Just reach out and let us know. You can also support us there, and, and we'd be grateful for, for anything. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you, Daniel, for being with us, and thank you all those watching out there.